For this episode of Scholar Talks, the guide in question is what were the political and intellectual forces that shaped modern American conservatism? Matthew Continetti, our guest, is the Director of Domestic Policy Studies and the Patrick and Charlene Neal Chair in American Prosperity at the American Enterprise Institute. He has been an editor of the Weekly Standard and the Washington Free Beacon, and is the author of three books, including today's topic on his book, The Right, The Hundred Year War for American Conservatism. I am Tony Williams, a senior fellow at the Bill of Rights Institute, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Scholar Talks in our series, Topics in American History. Matt, I want to thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Tony. It's a pleasure to be here. Right. And really love the book. Really uh, an expansive, uh, provides an expansive understanding and look at modern American conservatism. Uh, all the different strains were really fascinating and, and how they were sometimes uh, worked in tandem, but then also at other times showed some divisions um, and some tensions. Uh, and honestly, just a, an extremely readable and very, very interesting book. So congratulations on that. Well, thank you very much. Great. Well, let's get started then. Uh, my first question is kind of general. So, uh, you know, what's the definition of conservatism that you're using in the book? Or are there many definitions of conservatism, depending on who you ask? Well, I think that's it. I think there are many different forms of conservatism in the world. The great political scientist Sam Huntington once said that conservatism is a situational ideology. It really depends on what you are trying to conserve. And so, in my book, the definition I use is that American conservatives are attempting to defend the American founding, the principles, the ideas, and the institutions that were set up beginning with the revolution in 1776, but then culminating in the constitution in 1787, and then following through the American political tradition from Lincoln, through Martin Luther King Jr., through Ronald Reagan, that American experience that particular form of American experience, which includes democratic politics, an emphasis on individual liberty, religious freedom, individual rights, constitutional government, that is what American conservatives have been trying to conserve throughout the 20th and 21st centuries. Right. Yeah. And, and in general, as I was saying there, you describe a lot of the different kind of parts of conservatism. Um, relationship to the Republican Party, for example, the conservative intellectual movement, all these populist strains, the think tanks and the media, other institutions. How do these parts of the movement, you know, help build conservatism over time, but then also at other times lead to some tensions within the movement? Right. Well, it's a very uh, large movement. It's one of the most important social movements and political movements in the history of America in the 20th century, you could rank it with the environmentalist movement, for example, or the women's movement, or even the civil rights movement, not quite as powerful, of course, as the civil rights movement, but still up there. And so like any of these movements, it has different factions. It's really a coalition of different persuasions. The two main ones have been more libertarian-minded thinkers and activists, people who really wanna constrain the federal government who believe that the Constitution is a document of restraint over the federal government, libertarians who want to increase the power of the marketplace and choice and competition in our daily lives. So you have them on one hand. On the other hand, you have the more traditionalist conservatives, conservatives who really want to preserve not just the constitutional order, but institutions like religion, the family, the neighborhood, the locality. And even though these two branches of conservatism in America can go in different directions and often do, they have historically shared an animosity toward the central government in Washington, DC, because not only can government limit economic freedom, it also can intrude upon those intermediary institutions that lie between the individual and the federal government, places like the family, or the neighborhood, or the church. And so libertarians and traditionalists have worked together in the past. The name for this coalition was coined as fusionism back in the mid 20th century. And I think in their hearts, many American conservatives are still fusionists today. Uh, they still believe in a 
large degree of individual freedom, but they also want to preserve those important attachments that one finds in the home, in the area around you, in your voluntary associations. The issue I think today on the right is that there's a large force pushing for fissionism <laughs> and people trying to break apart that, that partnership, which has worked together and in my view been successful uh, for many decades. Reach its maybe uh, greatest successes, uh, especially after being maybe in the wilderness, the political wilderness, um, and thinking of the days sort of of the, the early Cold War, William F. Buckley, and, and starting National Review, of course, in 64, Goldwater uh, has that massive um, landslide defeat. And yet they go from the political wilderness, conservatives do, to this great ascendancy with Ronald Reagan. We launched this Reagan revolution and conservatism seems to sort of really be on the ascendancy or sort of won at that point, um, especially uh, sort of towards the end of the Cold War. So so how did that happen? Well, the American public uh, moved to embrace conservatism, uh, not because it suddenly read Russell Kirk and Milton Friedman and thought that those ideas were uh, right on the, on the merits necessarily, but the American electorate was kind of pushed into conservatism by the overreach of uh, liberal Democrats in the 1960s and some of the excesses of the Democrats in Congress uh, in the 1970s and in the White House with Jimmy Carter. What I find again and again is that conservatism's biggest electoral triumphs, usually through the Republican Party in the 20th century, have been a backlash against liberal overreach when Democrats are in power. And so right after that landslide defeat in 1964, Barry Goldwater loses very badly to Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson thinks that he is the reincarnation of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He's going to expand the welfare state. He launches the Great Society. He also um, increases the tempo of our involvement in Vietnam. Very soon, the American public began tiring of LBJ. Uh, they began tiring of the anti-war movement, uh, the student rebellion, civil unrest in America's cities, rising crime, welfare, addiction. Then later, once Jimmy Carter is president, uh, the American people are also growing very tired of inflation. Uh, they are tired of national humiliation coincidentally, in Afghanistan <laughs> and in Iran. And from all of this, the American people look to alternatives. And suddenly, figures who had been on the margin, figures like Friedrich von Hayek, the Austrian economist, like Milton Friedman, the Chicago economist, like uh, Saul Bellow, the novelist uh, from Chicago who had a kind of a conservative bent, all of them are be being awarded Nobel Prizes. Conservatism has a strange new intellectual vogue in the late 1970s. And then this culminates in Reagan's landslide in 1980. And that allows conservatives finally to have some influence over the levers of power in Washington, D.C. And they begin to pursue the agenda that they had been working out during those wilderness years, an agenda of economic reform, an agenda of really taking the fight to the Soviet Union in order to pressure the communist system. Uh, and then social reforms, which took uh, a little bit longer to manifest themselves, uh, mainly in the welfare reform uh, passed by the Republican Congress and signed into law by a Democratic president in 1996. Right. And, and it's really interesting because you're talking about a lot of these sort of great successes, sort of economic recovery after the stagflation of the 70s and, you know, sort of winning the Cold War um, some of these other great successes of the 80s uh, and into the 90s. And, and yet at the very time of its greatest triumph, we have this sort of fracturing of, of the conservative movement as well. And so what, what caused this, this fracture in the, in the 1990s, 2000s? Uh, you talk about it you know, leading to the rise of, of this populist moment, if you will, uh, especially with the rise of the Tea Party, for example, uh, with the Great Recession of 2009. And, and then, of course, perhaps culminating in, in Donald Trump. I think the place to start would be the departure of Reagan from the scene. Reagan leaves office in 1989. 
His chosen successor, his vice president, George H.W. Bush, uh, knew that he had to get along with conservatives, but was not a movement conservative himself, and very quickly begins to deploy, disappoint conservatives, um, most spectacularly in his budget deal uh, that raised taxes despite his pledge to the American public that he would not do so. And so the conservative crack-up begins during the H.W. years, and it is magnified uh, when the Americans win the Cold War against the Soviet Union, when the, the Soviet Union begins to collapse and eventually uh, annuls itself in December of 1991. Conservatives had long defined themselves in opposition to communism and specifically the communism promoted by Moscow and the USSR. And so that big bad, that enemy, just disappears overnight, which leads to many questions among conservatives about what are we for now? What is America's purpose in the world? What is the purpose of our foreign policy? What is our relationship to the Republican Party if H.W. Bush is raising taxes, he's not really a social conservative, he's kind of a realist in foreign policy, not quite where we were in the Cold War. How do we relate? And so the Republican Party begins a series of internal debates. And I think this debate is really exemplified by the contests between Jack Kemp, the congressman from Buffalo, New York, who was a supply sider, an optimist, a believer in big coalitions in consensus and economic growth, versus uh, Patrick Buchanan, who in the 1990s begins to adopt an economic nationalist strategy, uh, begins to double down on social conservatism, uh, who be, uh, embraces a non-interventionist foreign policy, the policy of America first. He was the first person to revive that slogan from the 1940s, long before Trump, and who also likes the politics of confrontation rather than the politics of consensus. And so these two wings of conservatism and of the GOP, one represented by Kemp, the other by Buchanan, kind of go back and forth in the 1990s. I think we can say in the 2000s, the Kemp side predominated in the figure of George, H. W., uh, George W. Bush, even though Kemp disagreed with the Iraq war, that's kind of another story, but in general attitude of wanting to embrace immigration and wanting to reach out to minority populations in order to promote economic growth, W was Kempian, whereas the Buchananites tended to be on the margins. What's happened in the past decade is a field reversal. And now Kemp figures like, say, the former House Speaker Paul Ryan, who was uh, an employee of Kemp's in the 1990s, uh, he is now on the margins of the Republican Party and it's Buchananites or people who resemble Patrick Buchanan in the center. And most famously, most importantly, of course, Donald Trump, who ironically ran against Patrick Buchanan for the Reform Party nomination in the year 2000, but ended up in 2016 and throughout his presidency and today really reflecting Buchanan's views on immigration, on foreign policy, on trade. And on the idea that the only way that the right is going to win is not by working with the left, but by steamrolling the left. So as a follow up, but, you know, in the book, you talk, I think, a lot about the force of, of globalism, right? It, what, and how it impacted our economy and immigration and, and a number of other issues, uh, but particularly sort of causing this divide, perhaps, um, between you know, sort of the sense that there are elites and sort of, you know, the common man sort of left behind. So how, do, how did that play into all of this populism as well? Well, I think beginning around the year 2001, uh, there were great changes in, uh, in America and the world. Um, one was uh, a migration began from Mexico uh, and illegal immigration really came to the fore in many people's minds, just as the George W. Bush administration was trying to liberalize our immigration laws and to legalize the status of many people who had been here illegally for many years. While that's taking place, you have the introduction of China into the world trading system, 
the so-called China shock. And just the overwhelming size of China really does change the nature of American production. It leads to offshoring of jobs. It leads to increased automation. And so manufacturing employment is hit pretty hard by the rise of China. More broadly, you have uh, a change in who, who gets what in the global economy. Uh, workers with college degrees begin to be rewarded more and more for their educational attainment, whereas voters who have no college degrees uh, begin falling behind. Uh, it's hard to put a word on this, but basically I like to call it with the politics of knowledge, that is, or the, the politics of educational attainment. The higher education level you have, the better off you're doing. Also, the more likely in the first two decades of the 21st century, you are to be a Democrat. And so these three big changes kind of unsettle the party coalitions. And it's made the Republican Party much more reliant on voters without college degrees. And as a consequence, the Republican Party has become much more populist as a result. The Republican voter today is not quite the same as the Republican voter who upheld the Reagan coalitions in the 1980s. Um, they're probably more concerned with economic security than they are economic opportunity. Um, they're more distrustful of elites and expertise. They're less likely to think that America is uh, involved in a grand ideological crusade to promote democracy overseas. And so as the nature of the coalition changes, so does the party policies as well as the leaders of that coalition. And I think we can see that uh, on view today. And maybe thinking about where we are, where we're going, um, my final question is, you know, what seems to be the present direction for the, the future of this divided conservative movement or maybe just this populist conservative movement? What, that, what might that mean for, for American politics, American society, maybe in the, you know, in the next few years, next decade? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, my basic view is that uh, it means American politics is going to get a lot rowdier there are going to be a lot more confrontations and fights. Uh, there's going to be some political violence. We have lived through this uh, in the past few years already. And I think it means that um, we're going to have to work very hard to form new coalitions, um, new ways of addressing our public policy challenges, uh, new alignments, both within and between the parties. I note recently uh, a lot of interest in the Problem Solvers Caucus on Capitol Hill as potentially offering a way to keep the government funded uh, so that we can work on our longer-term budget issues. Um, there's great interest in independent candidacies or even a no-labels uh, effort in 2024. The general uh, negative attitude toward the direction of the country and the kind of low opinion most Americans have of our politics is depressing and um, not reassuring, but it also potentially offers an opportunity. I do think we'll work it out. It just might take a while and the road might be very bumpy from here to there. Right. Well, I think the good news is I think some of your colleagues, Yuval Levin uh, and Jay Cost, and, and I know you are sort of looking for maybe ways to build a great, try to build greater consensus in the middle of all this turbulence and try to seek ways to, to compromise and, and to talk to each other a little bit more. And I guess we can only hope for that, right? Absolutely. We're, we're trying our best. Good, good. We're, we're all in this together as Americans. All right. Well, Matt, I want to thank you very much for joining us. Congratulations on the book, and uh, we appreciate it. Thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us on this episode of Scholar Talks. Please check out our other interviews in this series, Topics in American History, on our channel.